Uh, welcome to my talk about the current state of Inc. Inc is a smart contract programming language based on the Rust programming language. Um, and uh, why is that slide empty? And what's that over there? Well, that looks like an inclamation mark to me. Can we <laughs> can we shortly look take a little closer look? Oh, it's so cute. That's the mascot of Inc. We now have a mascot. It's not only cute, it will take us through the presentation. And it's really into dots. It likes to sit on dots. So if you forget the exclamation mark in Inc, you forget it. It makes it sad. If you forget to write the I in Inc small, you also leave away a dot. It also makes it sad. It brought stickers, but only for those who are visiting the workshop tomorrow. We, too, we have too few of them, I'm sorry. So Inc. is a united force work of many people. We, don't, we not only have the core team, we also have the UI team, the documentation team. We have uh, Sveta who made the mascot. Uh, we have Sergey, because he's Sergey. We have, we have the CI team and many, many more. Um, when we are thinking about smart contract programming, we face mainly three main problems. That's for one, for one's uh, gas costs. We have to pay for everything with gas. We need a low memory footprint because our WASM binaries, or generally our smart contract binaries, are distributed over all the network. And it needs to be fail safe because apparently smart contracts might deal with a lot of value. We at Parity know that. If there only was language that would suit, suit our needs. And as we know, there's Rust. And Rust has many cool features that allow us to have these properties that we need. And also, Substrate is built in, with Rust. So if you are a runtime engineer who builds runtimes with, using Substrate, you are now also able to uh, program smart contracts with it. Another cool feature is the first class WASM support in Rust. And taking that into account, let's look at EVM bytecode. It's pretty specialized, it has a cane semantics, it's rather complex. In comparison to WASM, it's rather generalized, it has very clear semantics in general, and it's pretty simple. On top of that, it's uh, designed to be sandboxed. What that means is, if we are looking at uh, Quill playing in a sandbox, and it's, it's uh, deployed on a blockchain, basically, right now. Sandbox, it uh, behaves with transactional uh, operations, it uh, respects gas limits, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also play together, but each of you has to be in its own sandbox for security reasons. If you ever try to not do this, or just to, to uh, yeah, just play around the system, the frame contracts module is going to intervene. That's one of the guarantees we give. What are the ingredients for ink? It's, it's on the one hand side Rust. We have the frame contracts module, and we have Wasm going ink. And we also have to admit, we have to admit that we recycle the best parts of Solidity. How is the ink interface between the frame contracts module and ink? So basically, it's, <laughs> it's about uh, a C API that is pretty low level. So we, we have an X address, X caller, et cetera. And Inc. is basically trying to make it user-friendly accessible for users. Um, Inc. also has a metadata that it prints out. I think the Stack Technologies just showed it uh, partially. We'll go into that, uh, deep into that into the workshop. Uh, this is how it looks like. And what metadata actually uh, provides you with is information about the types, information about the general contract structure, about the storage layout, and names and document, uh, documentation of it. So Inc. does not only produce the WASM binary that is going to be feed into the frame contracts module, but it also produces metadata to be feed into third-party tools such, such as the Polkadot.js UI to make it... Uh, appealing to interact with contracts. Where did Inc. come from? So earlier this year, I was presenting Inc. together with Sean, and it was looking more like that. Um, so 
I, I won't go into details, don't worry if you cannot read it. Um, what it looks now like is this. So you can, you can make a direct comparison of the sim single uh, modules that we have here and there. This is the old approach, this is the new one. Um, you see, syntactically, it changed a lot. And one of the reasons was, this is the old version, and we had basically a very clear separation between Rust code and Ink code. So everything inside our Ink contract module macro definition uh, was only allowed to be Ink code, whereas all the other parts around it was only allowed to be Rust code. With our new structure, we allow this interior to be Ink and Rust, which uh, makes the both languages just Rust, basically. So we, we further enhance the coupling between those languages. Now we see this abomination of a code, like probably written by someone who is not in the mood. And with, this is the new structure, so we can actually apply Rust tooling on it. And let's make it beautiful by using Rust format. It now works because Rust tools pretty much better work on uh, uh, on this format, since it applies just Rust rules. It can apply Rust rules in that. So Rust tools work out of the box. Not only Rust format, but many other tools as well. If we are looking at the, we are now looking at the different components to make up a single smart contract in Ink. We, first of all, we have the header. It's basically consisting of a mandatory uh, version field. It's basically specifying the current used Ink version to have deterministic rebuilds. And it has optional parameters such as this env parameter that you can specify to make uh, ink work on your own custom chain with uh, custom types. And everything below that wrapped inside the module is ink and Rust code, basically. We have this ink decator here on top. For, for every ink structure that is basically an ink item specialized to ink, we always have those markers. So here, Every ink contract specify, has to specify a storage. In this case, I show you the ERC20 storage layout. We have a total supply that is basically a balance. We have a balances hash map from account ID to balance. And we have an even little bit more complex allowances map from a pair of account IDs to a balance. Then we can also specify events in ink uh, that are uh, pretty similar to the uh, solidity events and we had, it's, it's basically just a normal Rust uh, struct definition. And what was an index parameter in uh, Solidity is now an ink topic, just a marker, nothing more. And you can invoke the, or emit these events using code like this. So you basically uh, create this event and use this rather short line. That's it in your contract, basically. We have ink constructors, and an ink smart contract can have multiple of those, and they can even delegate to each other. And they have to respect certain rules. For example, this uh, smart contract constructor has an initial supply, takes a balance, uh, takes a caller of the current call of this uh, smart contract. It sets the total supply to initial supply, and then it, in the balances, uh, it initializes all of the funds to this caller. That's what it does. Um, if we do not respect the conventions for constructors, like for example syntactical errors or even type errors in some cases, we receive pretty significant errors that are pointing to the issue. So it's not always like, oh no, we are operating on macros and it's always ugly to debug. It's not like that, not, not always like that. Um, we have, for example, in this case, sorry, in this, in this case we forgot to make this mutable and it's saying us that we need to have specified this with an ampersand mute self. In this case, we added an additional return value which we are not allowed to, and it says that. Ink messages are also pretty similar. We simply specify a method and annotate it with the ink messages in, uh, indicator. Here we simply show you the ERC20 for total supply. And can anyone tell me what is special about this code? I'll give you a hint. So what this code does is, even though this looks like a normal Rust call to a function, or this as well, it in reality is a cross-contract call. 
So this is uh, copied from the delegator contract that has adder and subcontracts. And while this is just looking like a normal Rust call, what it in reality does is it goes through frame contracts module and calls the other contracts on the chain. This is the integration. It's also type safe. So you have everything you want to have. And depending on the switch state, like we can see here the switch, uh, it either calls ink or deck on either adder or subber. Uh, in the workshop, we are going to create one of those contracts, and we also enhance it with further security capabilities because our current examples do not have this. Next, considering delegator, it also has to instantiate those contracts. It's subcontracts, basically. Uh, if we are looking now, we are looking at the accumulator contract. It's basically a contract that simply has a value that stores it, basically. That's all. And for that, the constructor takes an initial value, and we simply initialize, initialize the initial value by it. If we want to instantiate this contract from the delegator, we can see we, we use just this call. We first of all use accumulator new with the initial value. We want to set it. Then we give it a certain value. In this case, we just give it half of our own value. We are telling it which code hash it has to use, and then we create it. That's it. And now you have an, your own instance of, on the chain deployed and up and running. And you can use it even in, in a type safe way. The interaction with, uh, with uh, contracts is basically what Stake Technologies just showed in the last talk. Um, we have the Polkadot.js UI, and we can upload our contracts and even specify our metadata. Um, and the, the tool will simply read out everything and give, gives us a nice overview and with return values and parameters, etc. cetera. Uh, we can deploy such an uploaded contract, give it, a, like, choose one of the constructors, give it an initial value, etc., and then call one of those deployed contracts. And we can even specify RPC calls so that we can immediately see the return value. Now let's talk about the future of ink, uh, because what I told you right uh, so far is things that already exist, things that you can already use and already play around with. What I'm going to show you now is plans for the future, things that are not yet implemented, things that are maybe a little bit unspecified, underspecified. But let's look into it. So, for once, we already talked about metadata. And we thought, okay, ink procedural macros have certain limitations. So, I, on the one hand side, it had, has advantages because we are using Rust on the, we are sitting on the shoulders of, the, of Rust. And by that, we can also use all the Rust tooling and the features of Rust, et cetera. Um, but we are limited in other ways. For example, we cannot access type information during the compilation, to it, so to say. By using and leveraging the metadata we create ourselves, we can eat our own metadata back into the contract uh, compiler and profit by that by using enhanced capabilities to uh, generate better code. Better code in a way to make it more type safe, to make it more performant, etc. And Next thing is we also want to implement trade support and generic support into our contracts. So, for example, we can have uh, generic contracts calling contracts through interfaces and storing them. And this also allows certain callbacks to into contact, uh, contracts, which are right now a little bit more tricky, to be honest. We want to allow multi-file projects. Right now, smart contracts in Inga are always uh, limited to having only one file. We are already working on plans and ideas to mitigate this limitation. And in this case, for example, we have uh, certain modules where we have to specify their paths in the file system. And then we could, in theory, uh, allow for multi-file projects in Inc. So you can have Inc projects that are modular. We want to integrate pre and post conditions, uh, also pretty similar to what has been done in Solidity, um, but in we think it's really important to not waste gas when on the same time having those. Um, so it's, it will be very important to us to de implement it with a design that fits more into static assertions that are done on compilation time if possible. We want to build in errors into ink. This is mainly due to the fact that we want to reduce and shrink uh, the binaries that are coming out of ink 
and put as much as we can into the metadata instead because the binaries are distributed on the chain, whereas the metadata is not. So it's just, yeah, one of the techniques that we want to deploy for that. One thing, this, this is something I want to show you because uh, we are sitting on the shoulders of Rust. And it's kind of a little bit bigger than we are. We profit from many of its features. So once, for example, Rust implements the feature, they are already, like, there are already plans on the Rust side um, to allow for crate level procedural macros attributes. We can simply use the feature from that point on and there, there will be very little uh, work to be done on our side for that. So, and there are many, many more features in Rust that we can just use out of the box as soon as they are available, which is one of the great points behind Ink and the way we use to implement it. There's also the Ink CLI. This is our cargo plugin to allow for a better developer integrated workflow. It just has the very primitive comments so far, but we want to extend it in the future very much. So your whole developer experience and life cycle will be through, through that uh, cargo plugin. Some open questions are how do we treat unsafe rust? How are we going with gas costs? They are not stable right now. Um, how are we doing with dynamic linking? It would solve a lot of issues that we have right now with certain built-in functionality. Parallel execution and we even think about a standalone ink compiler. One thing I want to show you from Stake Technologies is they have implemented a really awesome ink playground. You can just start it, the link is right there, and start it in your browser, play around with it. I don't know if it works right now, but it did for me, so it works, cool. So it's, it's, it's amazing. I can really recommend you playing around with it. You have to set, do no setup at all. You can just start it in your browser, do it, and have fun. If you like the, uh, the project, you can also visit our GitHub and contribute it, uh, file bug reports, uh, give us your ideas through the issue tracker. We are always happy for your contributions. And more to come in the future, but amongst, uh, besides everything I said, Ink is all about empowering the laugh between Ferris and Quill. Thank you. Questions? Bonus points if you can create an ink pun. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I'm wondering if there's any testing platform or framework for the ink contract. Um, you, can, you can test ink right away. Yeah, but any tool set that can allow like a mm, seamless uh, continuous, continuous delivery for ink uh, contracts, like I can. So you, so, you mean what, what I, for example, use to develop ink smart contracts? Uh, so for example, for Solidity, we got Truffle and uh, we got uh, I'm not aware of, test. I'm not aware of anything mm -hmm. like that right now. Okay, so we use the uh, usual Rust tooling for testing. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's currently the, the um, we, we currently have the off-chain uh, testing in, implemented into Ink, but it's rather primitive, and we do not have yet integrated an on-chain testing, uh, but, but it's planned. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right. Uh, so are there any like roadmap or when can we think it becomes stable or in production already? Good question, thank you. Um, we, are, we had a roadmap, the roadmap is deprecated. Um, <laughs> we're working on it um, and I'll announce the new roadmap as soon as it's done in the Riot channel. We have a dedicated Riot channel for ink and smart contracts for Substrate. Hi, can you tell me what, um, what access smart contracts have to the modules, like accesses or storage? Like I'm saying, obviously there's a problem with what's done, 
that's revertible and, and what's not. Okay, um, we, we've just implemented a way to, sorry, to implement, um, we, we've implemented a way to access runtime storage through keys. It's not user friendly, but you can do it from uh, smart contract sites. Um, there are, are maybe going to be more ways. Um, we are kind of assistant to, to implement more direct interaction from smart contracts and, uh, and runtime because it's, uh, it's pretty critical. Like the, it has to be done right from the start on. Is there any plans for integrate uh, off-chain workers to smart contracts? Not that I know of right now. Uh, I think that it would be very cool if uh, some uh, some contracts uh, will have uh, off-chain workers. Like uh, because now uh, uh, every DApps have to have to. Um, off-chain integration, like uh, on Node.js or uh, any other stuff, and uh, if uh, it's it will be possible to post uh, on contract with off-chain, I think it would be very uh, great. Excuse me. Yeah, it's transaction, right? Yeah, on chain. basically, yeah. Uh, but uh, for customers, like, uh, uh, well, contract is uh, that that uh, uh, account can po uh, uh, deploy and use it, right? Uh, yeah. But off chain is like a more uh, update of uh, runtime. Off chain runtime. Uh, off chain off-chain workers is about uh, runtime, but not about contracts, as I understood. I, I currently cannot, cannot quite follow. Can, can you come, uh, come after the presentation yeah, and okay, talk to okay. me about that? So. Uh, so maybe the question is too early, but any rough idea about how contracts talk to contracts on another chain? Um, you're not the first one to ask. Uh, <laughs> I think we are working on it. Like that's all I can say. Basically, <laughs> it's not yet possible, but maybe in the future. Cool. I think that's it. Thank you.